My name is Owen Leahy. I work for uh, Bloomberg as a technical analysis specialist. So, fortunately, it's quite a quite an interesting job. I get to travel around Europe, Middle East, Africa, uh, and what I do most of, mostly is sit with clients. So, the interesting thing about this role versus other roles before, where I was investing money or where I was, or where I was giving trading advice, is you sit with the clients at their desk. We don't have positions, and we're essentially just working on on strategies with them. So. It's been quite interesting over the past year or two as we're releasing more of our back testing information is to see what clients do, what type of strategies they try to build, what, what type of systems they're trying to use. And uh, the kind of tongue in cheek title here, uh, the quest for the holy grail, is that what we tend to see is people constantly looking for a single indicator that is going to give them signals across every market. So it's going to give them buy and sell signals on every time frame, on every market. And I, I don't really think that exists. Where, where what, what I want to try and explore today is just some of the interesting aspects about backtesting. And, uh, and to do that, we'll run through a few, different, uh, a few different strategies, and we'll look at some strengths and weaknesses, and we'll modify them, and hopefully there'll, there'll be some learning in that. Um, OK, so I guess two principles I just want to outline that were in the blurb that we sent out with the MTA is good strategies should be simple, logical, and work across multiple markets and time frames, meaning if I build a strategy that returns 100% a year on the FTSE on a daily time frame, but it doesn't work on other time frames on other markets, I don't think it's going to work too well when I try to run it in real time. I've probably done a good job of optimizing the strategy across the data that I tested on, but is it really going to work going forward? So that's the first key thing. Second is that people always ask, uh, what's the best market for a strategy? So. It's not that the strategy that I build works really well on the euro. It might be that over the time period that we were testing on the euro, there were certain market conditions that that strategy worked well in. So for example, if I have a, a strategy that's long only and tries to buy dips in an uptrend, it's not going to do too well in a, in a market that's been in a downtrend for 10 years. And that's not relating to the market being the FTSE or the S&P. It's just about the conditions of the market. So that's the key, the key kind of uh, setup I want, to, I want to get out there. And again, I've got to give my own disclaimer. And th there's one or two of these slides uh, throughout. It's just a reference to Monty Python, the Holy Grail. So the best tip I probably will give you today is if you haven't seen that movie, go watch that movie. <laughs> it's, uh, it's, it's pretty good. OK, so jumping in, this is just a chart that unfortunately might resonate with some of you, which is when you're in positions, it's what traders often think oh. at different times of the market. And when we kind of collate this together for an entire market, we'll see that due to the pressure of markets and human emotion, <coughs> people will often make bad decisions. So I think it's, I think it's, it's Van Tharp who talks about before you take a position, you can calculate about six, seven quite complex things. So maybe the price of gold, its, it's relationship to the euro, and the brain can really make quite complex decisions before you trade. Once your money's on the line and the position's going against you and you're feeling a little nervous, the mind goes right back to the fight or flight response. Do I sell, do I hold, do I sell, do I hold? So emotion can really, I guess, throw people out of their, their best potential decision making uh, state. So again, when we, when we kind of collate this, uh, so a quote here from Larry Williams, trading systems work, system traders do not. And the idea here is that you might build the perfect system, but if you all of a sudden overrule one or two of those trades, they might have been the big winners that this system was relying on for performance. So the, the, real, the real concept here is with systems, it can be a systematic approach to markets, or it can be fully automated systems. The benefit of fully automated is that we don't have this emotional human interaction with the, uh, with the execution. Okay. All right, so why build systems? We want to reduce human error. We want to minimize the effect of emotion. We also want to potentially mitigate the impact uh, of a single individual. So let's say I'm a great trader, but I do it all on instinct, and I'm responsible for half the clients of my whole firm. The day that I get hit by a bus is, I guess, hopefully sad for my family, but also pretty sad for that firm, because all that, all that intuition, all that knowledge is lost. Whereas people working together, collaborating on systems, the system can, I guess, continue to work. You'll certainly lose something, but you're reducing that human element in the decision process, okay? Again, improve risk management, money management. I'm not just randomly deciding 
how to, how, how to put in my money, how to trade. I read a, an FT article and decide I want to go long gold today. It's not, it's not a random process. We have a set amount of rules. We've laid out a, an exact methodology. We've tested this methodology. And then the goal is to just try and run that methodology correctly. And then what we can do is we may have results from our testing. We can now see in going forward, how did we actually perform versus these tests? So that'll be a combination of things. Did we execute the system correctly? And were the test conditions accurate for what we were hoping to see going forward? OK, so in terms of the process, and what I'm going to jump into now in a moment is we'll look at some different strategies and test them. But I guess we've got the idea generation phase. That might be you're sitting at your computer, you're playing around with different technical indicators, and you decide this tends to work. That's your visual testing. Maybe you look back over other markets, other time frames, and say, okay, if I buy RSI every time it crosses above 30 from below, it tends to be a good entry. And that's the basis. It's an idea that should hopefully be logical. We can now test this over different market data, different periods, and see, does this hold true? Is this actually making money, or am I maybe self-selecting markets, or maybe remembering the times when it did work and not considering all the times? Let's sit right here, everyone. Considering all the times that it, um, all the times that it didn't work, it took small losses that I've underestimated. So then we refine the strategy. So this this group from visual backtesting, optimization, refining the strategy. This is kind of a, a loop or a process. You're going to test it, test it from markets, change some of the parameters, and then what we're going to do is uh, out of sample testing, which is very important. So let's say I've tested it on 10 years of data. Let's go find some data where I haven't optimized, where I haven't used these techniques to improve results, and see if we still get the same results. Okay? And then, again, as I came back, we don't have this single holy grail or perfect indicator. And it's not that I built an indicator that always works on the euro. It's about identifying market conditions. So do I have a fundamental or a technical screen to see what type of markets will this work on? If it's a long-only system, I probably don't want to run it on something that's been in a five-year bear market. It doesn't show signs of turn, right? Similarly, what we can do is we can look to filter trading periods. So maybe if something is above its 200-day average, maybe I'll trade it intraday to the long side. So it's just about deciding how can you filter, how can you alter these results with something that you can replicate going forward. I mean, you see a loss people or even advertise systems that works, it's returned 800% on the FTSE in the last year. I mean, you know what they've done has gone in and got the data, they've optimized the different characteristics and they've tweaked it exactly to that setup. Now, I guess they hope if they can have three or four good months after that, they'll bring in enough money to, I don't know, c c cover some costs or what they're looking for. But I, I really don't think those methods persist going forward. So that's what we're going to have a look at today. Some different strategies, some different instances, and how maybe we can uh, interpret them. OK, so first I just want to give a, give a shout out, I guess, to Paul Siana. He does the same, same job as me in New York. He was actually here in May. And maybe a quick test. I don't know if you guys were here. But he, he released a book looking at uh, hits on indicators in Bloomberg. So because Bloomberg automatically puts moving averages on the charts, We've removed moving averages. But of the top seven studies used by Bloomberg users, so quite a large sample, a few hundred thousand, maybe a million users, if we get that set of hits, one indicator accounted for 44% of the entire top seven. And that's, uh, that's RSI. So it's interesting to see so many packages of so many indicators. People can program their own indicators. But we have 44% of professional users globally across the terminal. And Actually, if I go here, we can see the distribution, the breakdown. Huge overweighting to RSI. So initially, what I'll do is we'll have a look at some RSI strategies, pull them apart, and then we'll, uh, we'll go look at some other, uh, some other indicators. Also interesting here, actually, is uh, that working? Yeah. See Ichimoku? That's GOC is Ichimoku. Five times more popular in Asia than any other region. And an interesting market we've been looking at is uh, especially used more in FX and especially used more in the yen. One of the, one of the best ways, I'd say, to trade yen over the last few years, especially with the recent moves, is through Ichimoku. It really uh, respects those levels. OK. So what we're going to test on is the S&P 500 for these indicators. And again, 
this is quite important, is to have a, a rigorous test setup. There's no point testing one thing on daily FTSE over two years, testing something else 10 years on the S&P. You want to have something rigorous so you can compare the different, uh, the different strategies. Okay, so we're using S&P, we're using a daily time frame. We're going to take 20 years of data up to the end of 2010, long only. We're assuming a balance of 100K. We're going to put all of our money into every trade. So there's not, no, no pyramiding, no money management, and we haven't deducted commissioner slippage. Okay? And again, I've focused on historical time frames, not intraday. There's no, uh, there's no particular reason for that. Um, but one thing to bear in mind that I, I think a lot of people don't consider is when they trade automated systems, I'd say there's a huge weighting of people trading automated systems trading intraday. Trading off 5 minutes, 20 minutes, 60 minute candle charts, let's say, or, or time periods. Just, just think about this. If, I, if my target on an, intraday, on an intraday trade is maybe 20, 30 pips, and, and let's assume I'll take the same risk target. If I've only got a 50% win ratio, I'm already losing money. Maybe it cost me two points to cross the spread, maybe another three for slippage. So a strategy on, on such a short term, when you're crossing the same spread on a 15 minute chart as a trade that you might want to take for years, you really have to be good to cover those commission and slippage costs. So I, if I wanted to take 10 trades a day, I'd much rather have five or 10 different systems working on a daily time frame that would give me different trades at different times. But just something to think about. Really don't underestimate the impact of commission and slippage, especially when you go down to uh, intraday. Okay. So just a few key statistics, and uh, I mean, you'll notice I haven't put in overall P&L because that's very subjective on money management. What we want to know is the number of trades. Because remember, with every trade we pay commission and we probably pay some slippage. What's the average P&L? Meaning every time I place a trade, do I make money, do I lose money? What's that amount on average? And that's what you want to compare your commission and slippage to, okay? What's my winning percentage? So how many <coughs> winners versus losers? And then profit factor. How big is my average winner versus average loser? The two of these go hand in hand. If I have a trend following system, so maybe so, similar to something like the Turtles did with these ATR breakout systems, donkey and channels, maybe I might take 10 losses for every winner, but as long as my winner is 20 times the size of those small losses, I'll make money. So it's not about just the win-loss percentage. It's about the number of trades, because you're always incurring a cost, and it's also about what's the size of the winners versus the losers. So bear that in mind when you're analyzing these. Sharp ratio risk-adjusted returns. So are, are, we, are we reliant on one or two massive returns for our entire uh, P&L? And if that's the case, I mean, we'll talk a bit more about price shocks, but you need to think about what price am I taking? Meaning, when you get these huge moves in the market, assuming that I get the opening price on the day the market shoots up 8% is maybe a little bit naive. And if that one trade is the key for my system being profitable or unprofitable, maybe it's best to eliminate those from data. So really today we're going to focus on a lot of these little things that can become bigger issues if ignored. Again, drawdown. I might have a system that makes me 400% but over four years, but maybe after one year I was down 80%. Now if you have a fully automated system, maybe you can do that, but we talked earlier about people interfering with the trades. I'd say at some stage someone probably interferes along the way. I don't know too many people that can stomach an 80% drawdown. And then the information ratio, it's like looking at the sharp ratio, except it's adjusted for a benchmark. And I'll show you later, we do some examples, and the best performing market always is the eyeball, the Brazilian market. <coughs> so when some things are up 300%, it's up 3,000%. So you look at these results and you think, this must be the best market to trade all my systems on. But then you compare it to buy and hold, and it's just that the market has done so well. So just like, I guess, a relative strength chart looking at a, a benchmark, so my stock is up 30%, but the market's up 50%, not quite so good. <coughs> Similarly, you want to look at this when looking at the results from backtesting. Okay, so we're gonna start with a nice plain vanilla strategy that I think 46% of people in Bloomberg use, and that's if they use it correctly. Um, we're going to buy when it comes out of overbought. Sorry, oversold here. So when the RSI crosses, not, in, not below 30, because it can stay down there for a while, when it comes out of that level, we're going to look to buy, and then the opposite criteria to exit long. Again, we're trading everything long only. So let's have a look. This is just the strategy setup. So we've defined 
that we're going to go long when it crosses above or over sole level of 30. This is very important. At next up, again, talking about these small things, the difference in results between executing at the close today and the open tomorrow can make drastic differences to an overall trade. Like, really, I guess the key point is people talk about backtesting like it's, a, it's an ironclad thing. I backtested that, it doesn't work. Whenever anyone says that to me, I, I'd, I'd like to sit down and have them explain five minutes their backtesting methodology. Because the slightest tweaks and changes have big, big impacts down, down, down the road. Okay, so again, this is just the setup. We've got our, uh, again, no commissions. Here's our, here's our trading range. Money management, 100% of capital in the trades. So, let's have a look. Again, this is from the 1st of January 1990 till the 31st of December uh, 2010. So 20 years of data. So, performance is positive, but uh, and the win-loss ratio is good, but, I mean, would you take 74% over 20 years in a strategy? What we have is average winner, almost double the average loser, so again, quite good. But issue here is, look at that max loss. We have one, uh, one trade. Remember, we're dealing with 100K. Now, we might have been up, meaning that might be out of 180K at the time, but that's a, that's a big loss. If we go down to the next page, it's uh, the same slide, but just includes the drawdown information. Quite a big drawdown. So, are you willing to take a 50-something percent drawdown over 20 years to make 70-something percent? I don't know. I, I, I probably am it. And that's, um, again, this is probably, this, as we said, the most popular strategy, or at least most popular indicator that people are using. So, it can be quite interesting backtesting indicators to see what works. I mean, another interesting one across a lot of markets, MACD seems to do terribly on every time frame until you go above, weekly and above. All the short term trades, I haven't seen it test well on, uh, on money markets at all. Okay, so what we've done, yeah, sure. Um, how do you build in the stop loss into your... Yep, you're, you're, you're preempting, you wait four slides. <laughs> so, um, so, so what we... Yeah. Just wondering for FX market or some other market mm -hmm. which operates 24 hours, how do you define the next open? Or will you lock in? Yeah, yeah, very good question. I mean, in terms of how we do it on the system, you, you define what market time you're trading. So if I take New York time or London time, it would define an open and close. But you make a very good point that it's a 24 hour market. And that's where thinking about different characteristics is important. Because also with uh, currencies, because they will react much quicker to data and news flow, they probably lend themselves better to shorter time frames. And if I was trading intraday systems, I'd probably use currencies. One, spreads are much tighter, and also, as you say, you're not going to take a big gap overnight that blows up your, that blows up your system. And maybe the back testing design will be different if you set different Yeah. Open and close. 100%, 100%. And, I, and that's exactly, e even if we started the results two days earlier over a 20 year time frame, we might take a trade that ends up hugely influencing the results. And that's, that's exactly the point I'm trying to make, is that people say, I back-tested that, it doesn't work. But it's quite, a, it's quite an unstable testing environment. It's, it's by no means conclusive back-testing. Yep. So how do you, do you use the straddle? Yep. I would say, how would that work? If you use the straddle, it reaches it. It reaches it. Um, reaches level, and you've got the level <coughs> and you Yep. Basically, stretch it in the strategy, yep. or you've got the strange as well. Yes, yeah, so, so, so again, th th that, that would depend on two things. W w one is that w w we don't actually focus on option strategies. But it, it would really. No, but the same thing is that you have that as a backup. You have. It's like, it's like op you know, options. It's just like you use uh, CDS, is, uh, they say it's a backup when you go into. Um, have options, so the one yeah. backs up the but, 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 but the, uh, I do appreciate what you're saying, uh, and that there would be a strategy. It's not something I, I can yeah. test, we don't use options yet, but it, it is a valid strategy. But again, you need to use it in the right circumstances because you might set up a straddle and the market might stay, you know what I mean? The, the market might, conditions might not suit it, you might lose money. So, so just like any other trade, it's just about how you, how you structure it. But uh, unfortunately, we don't. Uh, back test and options in Bloomberg, hopefully it'll come, but it's definitely a strategy worth, uh, worth, worth testing. Okay, so we have, we have it by country. Again, given that we've had relatively bullish markets over these 20 years, some long stretches, again, this, 
th this would not be something that I'd advise 46% of Bloomberg users to be trading. It's not, I mean, it, it, it doesn't show great persistence across the equity markets we have here, okay? All right, so again, if we look at the results, so this is just the, the monetary returns of the results. We can see we're taking a big hit, okay? So we've got one big loser here, because we've got a great risk return ratio, but we've got one big loser here that's killing us. So let's go in and have a look. If we zoom in, we can see this is a big trade during 2008. Does anyone see the big uh, flaw in our strategy? So what's happened is, is we've got a buy signal when it crosses above 30, an exit signal when it crosses above 70. But what happened was, there's it down here, we got this entry, but then the market switched from a bullish to a bearish phase and never went above 70. It didn't go above 70 until the market turned. So we had this giant period where we'd entered into a trade, but we never got out of the trade because it didn't meet our conditions. And this is something very common across strategies to be, uh, to be aware of. So again, what we'll do is, uh, I'm gonna play around with RSI now, but, but, but the issue here is that, um, how could we improve this? A few ways. We could alter the overbought and oversold levels, meaning, in a bullish phase, they say maybe the overbought is 80, oversold is 40, bearish phase 60 and 20. Or what we could do is maybe we're happy with the strategy, but we want to make sure we're not taking a, a 59K loss. So what we could do maybe is introduce a stop loss or something like that. So let's have a look first at the stop loss, all right? So what we're going to take is just uh, an arbitrary 10% of the price. So that doesn't mean the loss will only be 10K, because if we're at 200K, and we're, not looking at, we're looking at the percentage price of the actual underlying, so we can still take quite large losses, but hopefully it will solve this issue. We're not gonna take a, a, that, that massive loss we've seen during 2008, okay? So if we jump on, we can see the results. And this is where, so let me just go back. <coughs> what people might think is, oh look, here's the results. Let's just run a line across here, and we'll get rid of this one and keep all the other ones, right? But you have to remember, this winner here might have come down here before it finished up here. And similarly, these two losers might have come down here before here. So this is what I mean by small changes have big outcomes. But what would you expect it to be simple, but it can be more complex than that. So let's have a look. We can see that we've got a lot more trades because we're exiting the market quicker now. Performance has improved, which is positive. What we also have is the max loss has come down hugely. That was 56. So that's come right down, and we can also see the effect on the uh, drawdown. But here looking at the trades, we do have more losers, but we can see they're much more, uh, much more contained. We don't have this one catastrophic 56K loss that's gonna, that's gonna send us bankrupt, okay? So if we compare these again, look down at the uh, drawdown, it's gone from 52 down to 40. Win winning ratio has gone down though trades have gone up. So we can see the, uh, see the effect that it has. We didn't just remove that one trade by including a stop. It affected the whole, uh, the whole process, okay? All right, so let's try the other, the other method. Let's try optimizing it. So <coughs> now what we're gonna do is we're gonna test between 80 and 40 and 60 and 20, sorry, 60 and 80, meaning we're gonna try all the different combinations <coughs> between, these, uh, between these two ranges, all right? So we get the results. And again, across the different things. What's quite interesting here is, look at a very clear persistence of all the top results, right up near the max, right up near 80 and 39, is, 80 and 39 is the best, which is right about the extreme. So there's a few issues to that. So actually, let me just go on here for a sec. That's the rest of the results, but if we look at this on a 3D graphic, we can see up here, it's quite a stable area. We can also see that it's the most profitable. So there's definitely a good argument over this test to increase our, well, based on this, to increase our levels to 80 and 39. So what's that telling us? It's telling us that s and is in a bullish phase, but it wasn't in a bullish phase for those 20 years. But the issue is, is that we're running a long-only strategy. So the best trades for us are going to be in a bullish phase. I mean, if we have a look here, this is the most profitable, but it's six trades. We've gone from 20-something trades down to six, okay? But I'd, I'd say we're all pretty convinced that it's worth changing the, uh, the, the levels to 80.39. But look what happens. We actually analyzed where the trades came in. We essentially took a, t a few trades and then took a 15-year buy and hold strategy, which 
isn't exactly what you, you decided to use RSI for, right? And if we have a look, when we compare these, this is the, the big difference here. Look at this. 120 days for the average duration, 830 days. So I don't know too many people that build technical systems to go into a 15-year buy and hold strategy, right? So we can see here how we did find results that improved, and if we move on, the results actually improved across all markets. So we said we optimized this on the S&P, but it actually improved the results across all the other equity markets. But the reason that is, I don't think it's because they're the ideal levels. Our strategy is long only. So by having these extreme levels, it's going to take fewer trades, and it's going to take the trades that suit our strategy long only. Okay? So again, you really need to be careful of, of how you go through this process. All right? So here's the point a little uh, Monty Python put in here. Oh, small issues can become big problems. Don't know if you remember, we have uh, the beast from the movie, but it's just a, a visual kind of reminder uh, of what I'm talking about here. We make these small changes, it has huge impacts on, on what happens. So changing the market that we want to test is a big in, in, impact. The sample selected, so are we testing over two years, over 10 years? Do we start in, do we start in 2008, testing a long only strategy? Probably won't, won't perform too well. Periodicity, intraday, weekly, daily, monthly, <coughs> all these things have to be considered. We talked about current close versus next open, which are the two things we offer, but realistically, they're probably the two prices you'll never ever trade at, the open and close of the day. And especially if you're running a system and you want to trade in size, would something like VWAP be a better, a better uh, judge, high, low? So even changing those small elements, again, has, has big, uh, big repercussions. Again, slippage and commission to be considered and optimization. And we discussed this issue of price, sho price shocks. If you have a system where it's got two massive trades that are, that are creating all the gains, it's probably not as robust, robust a system as, uh, as, as you hope it is. I think there's, there's some chairs at the back if you guys want to work. OK, so we'll move on. So this is an idea that we played around with is We've talked about RSI 7030. We've talked about a bullish phase of 8040 for overbought, oversold levels. Bearish phase 6020. I can optimize these to one market, but what if I want a strategy that I can just automate and run across 10 different markets? I don't want to have to decide are these bullish or bearish. I don't want to have to optimize for every different market. How could I build an indicator that does this? So, again, the goal when you're putting these overbought and oversold levels is about 95% of the uh, of, I guess, the, the RSI movements will, will be between them. So we just want those extremes, just like Bollinger Bands, right? So what we've done here is put Bollinger Bands onto RSI, and the goal is, see here we're getting sell signals, but the value is only about 65. Here we're getting buy signals at 40, we're getting buy signals at 30. So it, w it will adapt. It's showing you that RSI is at an extreme, but it will adapt to whether the market is bullish or bearish, okay? So if we go in, this is actually coded. We have, a, we have a function on the system where you can code your indicators. So you can see all we've done is we've, we've coded RSI, we put it in as the input for the Bollinger Bands, and that, I mean, that's simple. That's the strategy. Pretty, pretty intuitive, pretty basic. We're going to buy when RSI crosses back above the lower band. We're going to sell when it dips above the upper band. So let's have a look. So much better performance here, 300% uh, over, again, it's over 20 years, so it's good, but Let's, let's keep it in uh, perspective. But look, from 61 trades, 43 winners. This is excellent. Average winner, larger than the average loser. Again, very good. Reasonable sharp ratio. But look at this. 121K max lit loser. We go to the next page. Same drawdown as RSI. So am I really going to trade this as it is? Maybe not. Again, what's the problem? Exact same thing with the RSI levels. We have an entry level, so we need the RSI to cross above the lower Bollinger. We're long. What we want is it to shoot up and cross back below the upper Bollinger and we make lots of money. But what happens when it gets us into the trade and then takes four years to get us out of the trade and the market's been going down, right? So again, we have an entry, we have a target price, but we don't have the correct risk management. So every system, you want an entry criteria, but you want multiple exit criteria. So that might be a target, that might be a stop loss, that might be a trailing stop loss that manages the risk. 
but it's an important element. So again, this persisted quite well across all these markets. In fact, the FTSE MIB and Nikkei are probably the only two of those markets that have been quite bearish over the test period. And have a look at our IBOV. Again, as I mentioned, look at the buy and hold results on that as well. I, I'd already booked <coughs> a ticket to Brazil. I was going to go become a trader. And then uh, f f ch check, the, uh, check the chart. OK, let's have the stop loss. So again, stop loss, still pretty good win-loss ratio. Average winner, still larger than the average loser. But look at this, max loss, still very big, but it's not 120K. And uh, if we go through and look at the, uh, I'll come back to the comparison, we can see it's done quite well. I mean, the drawdowns come down a bit, but again, not perfect. But again, I, I don't have the holy grail system to show you. It, it's more about talking about how to analyze these things. And we can see the persistence was still quite good across markets. Okay? So again, we want to test it on different markets, different settings. A good way to think about it is if you have an idea that you think is good, that you want to commit to money, and it's a bullish, long-only long only system, start running it on some bear markets. Start running it on some downtrends. Does it manage not to get you in <coughs> during the downtrends, or is it buying every, uh, I mean, every few bars on a, on, a, on a downtrend, and you have to get in and get out? If it's doing that, it's not going to make you money in markets. How does it do during ranges? Is it giving you a million signals when the market's going sideways, so you've got no capital left by the time the market goes up? So these are all things to consider. All right, so again, I, I want to focus a bit more on exits. So every buy <coughs> means, I guess, even a lot of training, things you read, they tell you when to buy. Very few things tell you, or, or people tell you when to exit. And there's actually an interesting uh, book I was reading that what the guys did is they, they, they reckon they had such good money management and such good exit rules that they did a study where they actually bought at random. They had a machine that just got them into markets at random, and they were still able to make money by using correct money management, using correct exit rules. So again, everyone focuses on buying, no one focuses on selling. So we have stops, but right there I picked two random 10% stop levels. That's something that to be optimized. But if I optimize that to 4% for the S&P, how does it work in all the other markets? So we need to consider that. Again, we talked about the different exits. We want a target price exit, but we also want something to manage risk, whether that's percentage of e equity, a monetary stop, but, but what I'm really moving towards is uh, trailing stops. These can be quite useful. And uh, in particular, what I want to introduce is uh, the chandelier exit. So this is something that, um, is it Van Tharp? But the Van Tharp uh, wrote about. We've, we've been playing with the Bloomberg. Uh, let me take a step back. It's based on volatility, price volatility, average true range. You guys actually, I, I gave around a research note, but there's uh, also one page on this. But what's interesting to look at is, what average true range is telling us, this is a one period history, <coughs> it's telling us how big is the range in the day. So think about it, when we've got a nice uptrending market, you might be up 1%, down half a percent, up 2%. When we're 2008 and equity markets are capitulating, we've got these 7, 8% ranges on the day. And what that's showing you is that there's, there's no real certainty between buyers and sellers. When the market's nice and tight, you know, buyers and sellers are in balance. When we have these big, huge swings, it's uncertainty in the market. Something interesting to look at, so here's the S&P. Look at these biggest days. And this isn't a random thing just to the market. I'm trying my best not to uh, curve fit this stuff. But if you have a look, it's a turning point nearly every time. And think about it. If you're, if you're here, I think the article actually went out here on this day. If you're here and you've made all this money, and the market's been quite reliable, volatility's picked up, and now you get this massive massive day of uncertainty, you're going to start taking profits, right? Once you get these large moves lower, all these people are offside. They're going to start selling. So even looking at the one period average true range is quite useful. Also, when you're setting stops, it's interesting to know what can a market do in one day. If I'm taking a huge amount of leverage on the S&P with 10 points, what if it opens up down 40 points? I mean, as, uh, as they'll tell you here at the spread betters, you're liable for that, it's, uh, especially if you're leveraged. So it's good to know the characteristics. What's the most this market has ever used in 10 years? That's interesting, or moved in one day in 10 years. That's, that's interesting information. OK, let's move on. Five period average true range. I really like this because it shows you market bottoms quite well. If you think about it, at a market bottom, you get these big capitulation days. So large, maybe down days, closing near the close. But when it turns, 
you get maybe one day stalling, but you get these big short covering rallies. So it's going to give you the largest five day average to range readings because you've had a big sell off followed by a big reversal. And again, look at this on different time frames, different markets. Look when it spikes above this level, you're seeing market lows. So it can be quite useful like this. So moving on, average true range over 20 periods. This is giving us an idea, or sorry, 22 periods. How much does this market tend to move in a day? Okay? So up top is the stop loss that we're talking about, the chandelier exit. What this is doing is it's taking a 22 period high and it's on the for the long exit and it's, subtract it's subtracting three times this number. Okay? So what we have now is a stop loss that will adapt to the different market conditions and the different price volatility of the different markets. Okay? So what I want to do now is so this is the code for the chandelier. I mean, if people want the presentations there, is I want to introduce a strategy now that's probably not intuitive. If I, if I asked everybody here what, what OSI period they use, be honest, would anyone have put up their hand and said they use two period OSI for their entries? Right? Doesn't sound too intuitive. Uh, this, I actually forget the book, I'll, uh, I'll find it out if people want. But they did a load of testing and they found that when two period OSI goes below five, happens very rare. So what you're talking about is two massive down days that have closed near their lows, so pure capitulation. Very often the next day you'll get a, you'll get a bounce. Sometimes that can be an entry, sometimes that can be an entry right at the low, but sometimes, I mean, this is probably going to lose money here after these two <coughs> days. But it, it's very common even if you just trade this the next day, so an intraday strategy. You get this signal and buy at the open. Even if the market continues lower, after such extreme selling, you usually see at least a relief rally. So you see maybe a retracement of the prior two days. So it can be a good thing to trade short term or it can be good to look at for long term entries. But interesting strategy, but it's an entry strategy. So we're going to use the chandelier for our exit. And this is, again, why I like the chandelier is we can, it adapts to the different markets and time frames. So if I want to test different entry strategies, I can use the same exit strategy and now I can compare the performance of the different entry strategies. So again, let's have a look. Does okay, 50% win loss ratio, but we have a nice win or a nice average winner to average loser. And if we push on, we can see again quite persistent across markets. Now these markets are all very correlated, except for these two down here, the Nikkei and the FTSE mid. But you want to make sure that you haven't adapted something to just one market that doesn't work elsewhere. So again, just talk about modifying indicators. This can be quite a slow indicator, the way it's constructed. But we can play around with the settings to give you something that's much tighter. And this is actually one of the, uh, my favorite things I've been playing with recently. Is What we've done is, the first 22 relates to the number of periods we're looking at. And the problem with that is, when you have a sell, sell off and a recovery, sometimes the stop loss will be above your entry price. So it has to go above to exit. You can take some big losses. If we reduce that period, it means that we're looking at a shorter look back period. If we change the average true range to 5 instead of 22, it's much more reactive to recent price action. So what we get is, if it's a short sell-off, the stop loss will actually jump right down and, and accommodate for that. But if it continues down a few more bars, it legs it. So again, just, uh, and this is something I guess we've been doing a lot now that we've been playing around with indicators, is to, instead of just using RSI and reading a book on what are the signals, think about why does this work? Where is this going to work? How could I change it? For example, RSI, change it to nine periods, you'll get much sharper moves. Playing around with the overboard, oversold levels. How does it work if I add Bollinger Bands to it? I really think there's a lot to be said for thinking about these things and, uh, and uh, experimenting. And back testing is the way to experiment as opposed to trying to overfit it to a market. Okay, the uh, research note you guys have, this is actually from the quarter beforehand, and it's a strategy I want to look at. So uh, I'll jump in quickly. What this is doing is, it's a, it's a moving average strategy. So we're looking at a 4, 9, actually, here's the chart to show it. Yep. A 4, 9, and 18 exponential average. So when the 4 is above the 9, which is above the 18, we're going to paint the bar as blue, so we're bullish. When there's some indecision, they'll be black. When 4 is below 9, below 18, it's going to be red. The reason we like this is moving averages and things like MACD, they continually cross over. And what you find when you start building systems, you can try to filter out these range periods using other indicators, but they eat up a lot of money, a lot more than you think when you're looking at the chart visually. So what's nice about this is it's not binary. 
long, short, long, short, long, short. Three things have to happen before we're going to get a signal. So more work has to be done. If we compare it here, these signals here are the MACD signals. So during this phase where we had no sell signal, whether you want to use this as a take profit or par partial profit signal depends on the rules. But we had a nice clean signal here, whereas over the same period we're getting lots of signals from MACD. Again, as I said, MACD is the second most used indicator after RSI, and I, I have a hard time finding any market of that <coughs> as a long short indicator. Okay? So this is the, the triple exponential moving average system. I say fast because the testing done in the, uh, in, in, in the magazine, or sorry, in the article, goes long, but as soon as four crosses below nine, it exits. And if they line up again, it goes long again. But what we've actually tested here, then we go to the uh, slow signal, is we're just testing the, uh, when, nine, when four is above nine is above 18, we're long, and then we're gonna exit when the other three line up. So straight away we know we're gonna be giving back a lot of profits. But the, the, the point I wanna make here is different. The reason I wanna show you this is I wanna show you something that's quite robust, works on a lot of different markets, works on a lot of different time frames. And that's why we use it in the article. Generally, we'll look at the combination of the weekly and the daily time frame to get a view, and then we'll use other, other signals within that. But if we run through, we can see, okay, performance, not great over 20 years, a lot more losers than winners. Again, this is a trend following system. So what we need is we need these big winners, which we're getting, and that's why we're making money. <coughs> but not a huge amount of money. But what's interesting, again, persists across a lot of markets. So again, I've talked about intraday. Everyone who builds systems wants to trade on five minute candles and that, that, that commission and slippage will kill you. But, but what, what's interesting here is on the daily time frame it does well. This is the exact same test period, except we're taking the signals from the weekly. <laughs> so now we're taking 25 trades instead of, I think it was about 60 trades. Oh, sorry, more, about 100. We've improved our win-loss ratio. Our average win has gone up, our average loss has gone down. Our max loss is much lower. And it persists even better across all markets. We're even making money on the Nikkei. Okay? Let's do it again. Let's look at monthly. We only get three trades, but we're making 400% on this particular indicator. And again, it persists across all the different markets. Now again, the issue is the drawdowns have increased, but they're not, they're not crazy. Even if we go back to um, is this the daily. So daily drawdowns are up around it's between 30 40 percent look at the weekly it's not much worse <coughs> so, again think about the time frames you're using does it really need to be a five minute candle now the points on this monthly one obviously i'm not going to try uh, i'm not going to sit and waste 13 years for my trading system i program so just like we looked before but how could we use this information okay what about filtering markets what if we now decide that I'm only going to use my RSI and Bollinger Band strategy inside this bullish phase. Or I'm only going to trade long strategies <coughs> when the bars are blue, when the market's bullish. So what that means is we're not going to trade the strategies during these bear markets. And this isn't something we've curve fitted. This is something we can do going forward. It's a simple rule. If the four period is above the nine, is above the 18 and the monthly, then I'm going to trade my RSI strategy on a daily time frame. You can use this in your methodology. Okay? So, all right, we're, we're coming to the, the end of the presentation now, but what, what, one key thing is we've done all our testing on this time, time frame, okay? And we can see the results. So nice to see that the RSI with Bollinger did well. You see that the stops weren't buy and hold is in here. Let's have a look now at the out sample. So this ended at the end of 2010. Let's have a look at how these did from 2011 onwards. And what we can see is all my hard work was for nothing. Buy and hold is the best, but not really, because it's also going to take large drawdowns, and this is a fact of the market going up. A buy and hold strategy when the market's going down for two years, not so good. But what's nice to see is look at all of the strategies in the market conditions that we're looking for are performing the way we wanted them to perform. Look across the different uh, profit factors. Oh, sorry, I beg your pardon. Sharp ratios are all quite similar, if not better, than they were in the test setup. <coughs> the max drawdown is, is, is tolerable for the amount of money we're making in most cases. But this is what's important to do. I mean, you can do all the work in this sample, and if it looks amazing, I guess you can try to sell it to some other people. But if you actually want to commit this to money, you have to do a lot of this testing. What I haven't done here, but I guess I would have done, 
if I had a few, little bit more time is, what about now testing it on this? So I want to test this on the footsie. Why don't I filter the signals based on, as I said, 4 above 9 above 18 and then run it? Does it improve my results? Does this work across 10 different markets? Maybe this is something I'm going to start doing. So just to keep that in mind, the out sample. So conclusions, to wrap up here, we talked about human emotion. So systems <coughs> can help mitigate the impact of human emotion, provided you don't interfere with them. Again, technical strategy should be simple, logical, and work across multiple conditions. And remember, it's not that it worked on the, on the euro, or let's say the yen for the last two years. It's that the yen was a massive bull run for the last two years, and you were running a long only system. So know the market conditions that your strategy performs in, and then find a way to find those conditions. Or find a filter that will find you stocks that are doing what this system needs to be done, as opposed to saying, it works, you know what I mean? it worked up until 2007 in the S&P, I'm going to put all my money in now into a long-only strategy, and hopefully my job goes well for the next two years. I mean, you need to think about all these issues, these, these price shocks, these situations. So that's what I mean by develop a, a methodology for categorizing the market conditions and use the right strategy in the right conditions. Again, focus on exits. Everyone will give you a buy recommendation. Not too many call you up and tell you when to exit. Same thing with strategies. You don't just want the ideal target price. You want to manage that risk. Is it a stop loss? Is it a trailing stop? Play around with these different things and think about it. And then an interesting quote I came across or a comment, it's not losses that ruin a system. We've got a stop loss. We know exactly how much money we can potentially lose. It's, did you miss that yen trade from 78 up to, what was it, 90 something? You miss that, that's an un a potential multiple of what a, stop, what, what a stopped out trade would be. And if your system's missing it, that, that's where you're going to get killed. And then finally, it's about developing an edge. And what we mean by that is test it. So if you think it works 60% of the time and return these type of numbers, if you're confident in that, Trade it. Don't come in on what was probably the best day to buy, but we're back to our sentiment chart. You're at your most bearish and overrule the system. If you trust the system, set it, let it run. Okay, so uh, thank you all very much for your time. I hope it wasn't, uh, wasn't too uh, complex. Any questions? Yes? Um, do you have any advice for um, back testing a more visual type system like? Um, um, you know, like um, shooting stars and habits and stuff like that. Uh, how do you kind of apply? Yeah, yeah. With that, you can. Yeah, it's mathematical. Yeah, but so I mean, all, all of that you can program. Sh shooting star, we've had an upside gap. We've had a. Oh, sorry, Vegas Biden. We've had a, we've had an extreme high. We have the body. You, you can program all of those. So w you can come in and program what are the characteristics of that candle pattern. Then you okay. can go try and find the strategy. So I guess another thing with these reversal patterns is there has to be something to reverse. So maybe you now want to add criteria that it's in an uptrend. And then I take this signal. And then it's, so it, it's about taking that and trying to find a way to create the rules and to create the strategies that could be tested. And, and that's kind of the real challenge. Do you mind putting it back on the exit slide? The, um yeah, thanks. Uh, I'm happy to send this out to anyone as well if they want to. Just, uh, just send me an email or you've got a copy as well, right? Yeah, I'll send an email to anyone. Okay. Sorry, yeah? Hi. Um, <coughs> I'm just assuming you've got the Bloomberg terminal to um, get the screen graphs. Yep. That's not available to a lot of retail. Uh, yep. Um, investors. Yep. Um, investors. Is there a good software platform that you can suggest for a non-coder to start developing? You're, you're asking me a tough question here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I mean, I mean there's, there's plenty of them out there. Uh, no, I, I, I mean, there really are. I mean, <laughs> we, we, we've looked at a few of them. It, it depends how, what, what you're trying to do. I mean, there's some that would... coding? So to come to that, there's definitely some platforms that will offer things that are, like ours, as kind of a drop-down menu, oh, where you sure. can say, I want to take a few of these things, and it will create an algorithm for you in the background. There is, there is some, some people doing that. Again, I'm going to avoid naming any names, but there's some advertised on TV at the moment that talk about exactly that. Simple strategy builders that migrate into other programs that would automate exit automatically. But really, if you're going to be committing serious money towards this, it's probably, well, and it'll take time, but it's probably worth trying to learn <coughs> some coding or learn how to do this in a more robust way. Because as I said, if th these slightest changes make huge differences. And if you're now dra 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 dragging and dropping a few things that are creating code, but you can't read the code, 
I don't know how much money I'd be willing to put at risk in, in, in that scenario. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, just one point. Um, isn't the random entry thing that somehow your money management turns the trades into profits, isn't that, um, like, isn't that predicated on having an infinite account? No, 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 that's fair. What I, what, what I imagine they did, and I don't know the exact studies, but it, it was just that they basically said the entries aren't important and they manage their risk quite tightly. It's effectively the Martingale strategy, the best. That's what it works out. Okay. But, no, no, but, I don't know, but I, I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure it's exactly okay. that. Because I, I don't think they would have taken unlimited drawdowns. What it's more likely is that they had a stop loss that limited the losses and they managed to run the winners effectively. It was money management. Yeah. So definitely was. So, so it's not like double down every time you, you have a loser. So it, it wasn't assuming unlimited drawdowns. The point was that everyone put so much thought into it, but they could take a random market move and they just cut it, cut it tight if it was losing and they try and run it if it was winning. And it was just that application was able to make money without everyone put so much importance into when to buy. Whereas when you come to systems, the exits are probably more important. Okay. Anybody else? We all done? If there aren't any more questions, um, first of all, um, are there any um, CMC <coughs> market guests with us today? Oh, great. All right, okay, for the uh, people that came on behalf of CMC markets and uh, other um, guests that are here for the, for the first time, right at the back we've left some uh, brochures explaining what the MTA is and what kind of services and benefits you can enjoy. Um, of course, we'll hope to see you again at our monthly meetings, our regular monthly meetings. The next one, obviously, in January. Free to attend. And again, if there aren't any more questions, we'd like to thank Owen for this presentation. Thank you. And see you again.